special this morning. He is our best friend. Sometimes uh, you may seem like he's your only friend when you seem lonely or lost or uh, in the valley. He's still there. He is still faithful. Praise be to his name. Thank you for the songs that have been sung this morning. Thank you for uh, those who have prayed and prepared for this service. We appreciate it. It does take preparation for us to come together and have an enjoyable time of encouraging one another and and edifying one another through singing and through preaching and through testimonies and other forms. God is good to us and it's a joy to be in the house of the Lord together. I want to give you a forewarning, all right? So listen up. This is a forewarning. I will be preaching this morning in part of Well, I will be preaching from Mark chapter 4, but as we go through this passage, I will be preaching about how Satan uses cell phones. Satan loves cell phones. Uh, And he uses them in church to snatch away the Word of God. Don't think that you've not experienced what I've experienced. All right? I've seen you. I've been guilty as well. Uh, But I'm giving you a forewarning, all right, because I'm telling you so that you're not caught off guard. So when I get to that point, uh, you're not embarrassed, all right? Uh, Your neighbor's not looking over and saying, well, there's Satan snatching right now. Uh, My neighbor, for the word of God, as as Pastor Fry is preaching. So that's your forewarning, okay? Uh, If you do see someone uh, during this time, just elbow them, tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, Satan is here. And he's right there in that thing. All right. Now, if some of you, I know you tell me uh, you you still have not converted to a a real Bible, uh, which is this uh, kind of Bible that you can uh, turn into. And um, you you don't have to power this on. You just turn right to it and you're there. All right. Uh, In fact, we have proven in this church, we have proven in our Bible drills that you can find the scripture faster in a real Bible than you can on your cell phone. We have proven that. If anyone wants to put it to the test, I will, I will go up against you. We'll put Weston up against you. Anyone else has a real Bible? We'll put, we'll put ourselves up against you and we'll see. All right? So if you, want to, uh, if you want to have that competition, just talk to us after church. We'll be happy to do that. We're looking at the passage of Scripture in, in Mark chapter 4 this morning. You could also find the same passage in Matthew chapter 13, but we're going to look at Mark's account uh, today, Mark chapter 4, and uh, please open your Bibles to uh, the first 20 verses of that chapter. We'll be taking a look at this. We'll be walking through there. There's a, there are some middle verses in this passage of Mark chapter 4 that I am probably going to cut out of my presentation this morning, my sermon this morning. They're in my notes, but uh, I'm embarrassed to tell you how long my notes are. Uh, so we're going to cut that portion out. That, that would be for verses 10 through uh, 13, because that really is a sermon almost in itself. But let's just jump right in. Jesus is telling us a parable. You know it as the parable of the sower, but really it's a parable of the seeds. Because it's really not so much about the sower as much as it is about the seeds that are being sown. And the soil in which the seeds are being planted. Let me give you some symbols as we go through and as we examine this big idea of the passage. The fruit of God's word is obedience in faith. It is obedience. That's the fruit that we're looking for. When we come to God's word, God speaks to us through his written word and through his spirit. What is God trying to produce in us? He's trying to produce a loving relationship in which the chief love language is obedience. Did you know that God's love language is obedience? Some of you are familiar with the five love languages. I don't need to introduce you to that probably. But God's love language is when we hear his word, we take it and we obey it. That's the fruit of his word. Now let's look at Mark chapter 4 and let's get into this passage. I'm not going to read. I'm going to save time and not read the entire passage because we're going to work through it nearly verse by verse. But in your small groups, you will take some time, undoubtedly, and you will read through this passage. But I do want to read the key verse. The key verse actually comes to us at the very end of this passage, in verse 20. 
It says this, but those that were sown, speaking of the seed, the, the seed that were sown on the good soil, these are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit. Some 30-fold, some 60-fold, and Jesus says some even 100-fold. That you find in Mark chapter 4 and verse 20. Let's just pause for just a moment as we ask God's blessing upon his word. Gracious Father, we ask that you would honor the reading of your word, the preaching of your word. And Lord, as you open up this passage by saying, listen, give us ears to hear what you have to say to us today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I remember one spring, sunny spring afternoon, very unlike what we've had. I was out around the house pulling up weeds, getting things ready for the flowers to, to bloom and to come up. They were probably already poking up through the ground, and, uh, but it needed weeded already. And so I was going through uh, probably this time of year, maybe a little even, even a little earlier, and I was pulling weeds and I came across a sapling. Uh, it had shot up. It was probably, I don't know, two or three feet tall by this time. And I was going to go pull it out. And I thought, well, there's something unique about this little sapling. It was, I knew it was going to become a full tree and it's too close to the house. But it was just perfectly straight. And I thought, well, I have a place in the yard that I would love to have a nice looking tree. And so I, I carefully got the shovel. I dug out, and pulled the roots out. I went out to the yard, found a good place. I, I put it there. I thought this would be a good place for a tree. This would be a, a beautiful place for a nice straight tree. I like straight trees. And so I planted it there, and, and that summer it grew from probably three feet. It grew up to probably five feet, maybe six feet, and uh, it, was, it was looking good. The next summer, I came out, the next spring, I came out, I was taking care of it, it began to, 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 uh, it began to get some buds on it, and I, I trimmed it up a little bit. I thought, well, this bud, I don't really want to branch down here. I really, you know, branches need to be up just above my head. So just, you know, five feet, eight, nine, somewhere in there. It's, it's perfect for a branch, right? Uh, and so you know, my wife likes them down here and so on. But I, I thought, I'm going to make sure this tree is so perfect. It's standing up straight. It's great. It's going to be a great tree. Well, years pass, and uh, that tree was growing. It grew up well above my head. I trimmed it. I shaped it, and it was a nice-looking tree until one spring I came, and there were, there were no buds on it, nothing. I thought, well, what happened? So I let it go for a while. I came back to it later. Still nothing. And so I, I kind of I, I kind of tugged on it a little bit and it came straight out of the ground. What happened? It had died. It had died. Well, what happened is I had planted it, and as long as it wasn't too tall, it got sunshine. But as it continued to grow, it began to grow, or there was another large tree nearby, it, it could not get the sunshine. I had been trimming off the branches down here that would have been getting the sunshine. I've been tra trimming them off because I wanted a nice tree, the bra lowest branches right here. It was gonna, I was going to let the tree be about 10, 15 feet, and it was going to be a nice tree. But I had cut off its source of getting life because this big tree over here was blocking the sun once it got up into that atmosphere here. And it died. The, the, the roots were not strong enough to sustain it. It wasn't getting the nutrients from the sun that it needed. It died. Well, what happens when seed is placed, is planted, a tree or whatever else the seed may be, when the seed is planted in soil that's just not appropriate or fitting for the kind of growth that God wants for us? The symbols that we see in this passage are very simple. The seeds, uh, the, the sower represents Jesus Christ. That's simple. Jesus Christ is telling the parable. He himself is the sower. The seed is the word of God. That he, he tells us this in verse 14. The sower sows the word. So the sower is Jesus Christ. The seed being sown is the word of God. And the soil then is our own heart condition. The ground in which the seed is planted. And we're going to see that the seed uh, is... is uh, is distributed in various places, various soil, and we need to ask ourselves, what 
kind of soil is my heart? What is the condition of my heart? Is my heart such that when the word of God is spread into my life, it's going to bear something fruitful? Or is it going to be like where I planted that tree, not really thinking, I thought it was a good place for a tree, but it wasn't. It was actually a very poor place for a tree. So we have the symbols of this passage and we understand that the seed is the word of God. And so we're talking this morning about the fruit that comes from the word of God. Fruitfulness from the word of God. Now there are a lot of well-intentioned people who are killing themselves, starving themselves of the sunlight spiritually because they're allowing other things, sometimes trivial things, some, sometimes things that really in life are important, but they crowd out or they choke out the most important thing, and that is receiving the word of God in our life and living in obedience, fruitful obedience to that. Remember last week in Matthew chapter 7, we read these words, every tree that does not bear good fruit, it is cut down and not just cut down, but it's cut down and it's burnt. It's thrown into the fire. I don't want to be thrown into the fire. I don't want to be cut down. I want to flourish. I want to be fruitful. Pastor Maury reminded us for years when he would tell us, let us be faithful. And I, and I want to repeat that. Let us be faithful. And one of the ways we are faithful, in fact, we, we are faithful. And we evidence our faith when we are fruitful. When we are bearing the fruit of obedience. And when we are bearing the fruit of other people becoming like Christ or coming to Christ because of us. Now, there are here in this sanctuary and those online, there are here probably some 20-year-olds, some 30-year-olds, undoubtedly some 40, 50, and 60-year-olds and above. Who you can look back in your life, and let's say you, you look back 30 years ago, and when you were a young person, you were, let's say you were a, a single young person, a, a young adult, and you're looking ahead, you're looking into life, and you, you have some aspirations. You have career aspirations. You have, you have educational aspirations. You have family aspirations. You have spiritual aspirations. You should have. And you, you imagine that the time will come, you're a young adult, but the time will come when you will be... Uh, you, will, you will have certain spiritual habits. So perhaps you've kind of been up and down in your spiritual daily uh, devotion and, and dedication to prayer or Bible study, Christian fellowship, whatever the case may be. But you imagine there's a day, one of these days, I'm just going to have that down. I'm going to have that down. I'm going to have a family. I'm going to lead them in, in prayer every day. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the leader. If you're the man, I'm going to be the leader of my home. I'm going to make sure my children learn scripture. I'm going to make sure they're in church every Sunday. I'm going to make sure that they my kids know how to pray and you have as, you had aspirations well I want to ask you today without you without you responding to me visibly or audibly can you remember some of those spiritual aspirations that you had back when you were a young person you remember some of those I do have you achieved those or are you now 30 years down the road still aspiring to have the kind of spiritual life that you aspired to way back then? You're really no closer to reaching those goals, those dreams, those passions. You, you, you wanted to be that spiritual, strong person, that tree planted by the water that's fruitful in its season. That, that, that you, wanted, you wanted that for your life, but you're, but you're still not there. You've gone through 10, 20, 30, maybe 40 years, and you've not accomplished the spiritual aspirations that you set out to accomplish. Christ calls us to a life of fruitfulness. And fruitfulness begins with His Word. When His Word is planted in our life, He expects that that will grow, take root, and then grow. This image in this passage that he gives to us when, he gets, when we get to the good soil. Notice this. That this, the good soil allows the seed of God's word. First of all, to grow inwardly. Root, there's a root system. It grows inwardly. And then when those trees. There's also been times. Let me just go back to my illustration. I pulled that tree out. The, the, the roots had given out. All right, It had a decent root system. When I planted that little sapling. It had a decent root system. 
I remember a few summers later when I went out and I, and I went out to pull some weeds and, and I went down and there were some weeds there and I leaned down just about like this and I leaned back and pulled it and ouch, that hurt. Those weeds were stronger than my back was. Uh, the, the, the roots of those weeds were holding on more than my back was holding on and I walked crooked for the next week. You see what happens for good or for evil Roots, we set roots inwardly. Spiritually, we set roots inwardly. And what happens is what we set inwardly eventually will come out. It will pop up through the ground. And we will see what's being produced inside there. What's being produced under all of that. You may think, well, I can just pull that out at any time. I can just, that, that evil seed that was planted, I can just pull it out at any time. It's just, it's just a weed. It's, it's not going to grow. I'm not going to let it grow that much. And then you go and you find out you do not have the spiritual strength to just pull that out right. on your own. Let's go through this passage. It's a familiar passage. It's a familiar scripture. Jesus begins in verse 3. He says, listen. Did you catch that? Listen. Now, notice in verse 9, he has told the parable. He has begun in, in verse 3 by saying, listen. In verse 9, then he comes back and he says, he who has ears, let him hear. It's like he had to go up to his disciples and the followers that were with him. And he had to say, you know what those things on the side of your head are for? They're to listen. And you know what's most important to listen to? God's word. It's amazing the things that, that kids or adults, that they will catch. Uh, you'll be talking in one room and they, the kids will come in and, they'll, and you thought they were playing and they were just you know, toying around over there. And they'll come in and they heard every word you said and they can recite it to you. Or worse yet, they don't recite it to you, they recite it to the babysitter. Or they recite it to the Sunday school teacher. All right, so watch what you say. But then you can come to church and they, don't, they can't remember a thing. Or they go to school. I can't remember. Or they come and they, they uh, pastor makes announcements. And pastor, uh, now what's going on, on on that day? Well, if you'd listened, he let him who has ears hear, right? So Jesus is going to his followers and he's saying, see there's things on the side of everyone's face. Just about everybody has them. Those things are to listen. That's, that's what those are for. Yeah. I mean, aren't those cute little things? Rarely are ears cute, right? Those things are very useful. And they're, they're wonderful. Wonderful to have. And we, you would look funny if you didn't have them. They're wonderful to have. You know what? There's a purpose. God designed those two little things on the side of your face to listen. So now, do you get it? Now listen. So he begins with the command, listen, and he ends with, listen. And then he continues that thought as he goes through the explanation. Now, he says, behold, the sower went out to sow. That's what Jesus does. He sows the word of God. And as he goes out to sow, he scatters the seed. And Jesus, we can imagine, he is pointing out to the listeners there. And he, he's pointing out where this seed would fall. And he says, see, some of, the, some of the seed fell alongside uh, the road. It fell beside the path. And so we understand that when uh, a farmer plants a field, he'll have his field out here. The path is over here. Here's the road. And between the path and the road, you're going to have a little bit of space. There's going to be a, a bit of unplowed ground. It may not be a wide space, but there's a little bit of unplowed ground ground there, unplowed soil. And Jesus says that when the farmer, when the sower spread some seed in his field, some of that seed fell on that roadside area, that, that ground that was hard, unplowed. It fell there. And what happened? The birds came along and they took it. That's what he tells us in verse 4. The, the seed that fell along the roadside, the birds came and they devoured it. Now let, go over to verse 15. He gives the explanation for this. He says, and these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. He says that when they hear, and now this is important, every single one of these steps, he points out, no matter how bad the ground is, he, he, he says this explicitly. He says, they hear. So even the ones where the birds are there to snatch it up and take it away, Jesus says, they heard. But what happened next 
happened very quickly. He says, Satan immediately comes and he snatches away the word. He takes away the word that is sown in them. Let's take just a moment and let's uh, make some application here. First of all, I think that Satan... By the way, if, if we thought that when we come to church, we, we just leave Satan behind and we just come in here and it's, just, it's, a, it's a holy place, nothing unholy can come in, you are deceived. All right? Satan goes to church every Sunday. I'm sure he does. And now, I, now remember, Satan is one individual. Satan is not, uh, is not uh, omnipresent. He cannot be everywhere. That's a supernatural, that's a divine attribute. So Satan himself is probably not here in our church today. I don't know where he is, but Satan's limited to one place just like you are, all right? Uh, so don't ever forget that about Satan. Satan also doesn't know everything, all right? Some people say, well, Satan's a mind reader. Well, no, he's, he's, a, he's, a behaviorist. he's a behavioralist. He, he's watched human behavior for thousands of years. He can predict what you're going to do or what you're thinking, but he can't read your mind, all right? right. Uh, those are divine attributes. Satan doesn't have any divine attributes at all. But nonetheless, Satan sends his employees to come and to make sure that uh, his birds, that's what Jesus calls them, birds come and they snatch him. He's, he makes sure that somebody that represents him comes to church with you. And he, 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 will, he, will, he knows all of the tactics. He, he knows that on a rainy day, it's hard to hear Pastor Fry preach. And we try to cool things down so you don't get, you know, when things get warmed up, you get tired, right? So we try to cool things down. We try, we, it's all part of the spiritual batter, battle. It sounds like a good excuse, doesn't it? But Satan's here and he is ready to, he will use anything. Have you ever spoken to a person, uh, maybe an older person, maybe a young person, but they have uh, these earbuds in their ear, you know what those are, earbuds? Uh, have you ever talked to a person with earbuds in their ear? Uh, you go up to someone and, and uh, you're pretty sure that uh, they're probably listening to Pastor Fry's sermon or Brooklyn Tabernacle or something. I'm sure that's what they're doing. But uh, you go and you, you need to talk to them or maybe you don't even recognize. I mean, they're, they're, like, they're staring, but they're not looking at anything. And uh, you go up and you talk to them. You need to talk to them. And, and it's, it's like they look right through you. And uh, you get kind of this weird feeling like, is anyone home? Are you in there? You have those things in front of your face. They're to see people. Uh, and you talk. That's how people. That's if, if Satan can stick his fingers in your ears. If he can stick some earbuds in your ears and play anything else. Even Brooklyn Tab. I don't know. If he can play anything in your ears to keep you from hearing the word of God. He's going to do it. There's some people who come to church and uh, they will, uh, they'll hear the word of God and no longer do they hit the sidewalk out here or out here. No longer do they hit the sidewalk and man, they're thinking about, oh man, uh, there's, a, there's a ball game this afternoon. Man, I can't wait to go watch that. Or, or there's, uh, we're going we're gonna to go do this next. They're on to the next event in their life as if the word of God is just an event. You have the word of God here. You hear that? Okay, I heard that. Now let's move on. Let's listen and pay attention to other things without any thought whatsoever as to how that word of God is planted into our life and God wants it to be fruitful. So there are people, and perhaps here today, or perhaps watching, that as soon as the service is over, it, you'll, you'll click that off, you'll walk out the door, and that's it. I mean, the birds are there, they're waiting. And you're almost holding it up in your hand. Here you go, where are the birds? Take, take the word of God. Now, some, for some of you, for some of us, uh, we don't even have to hit the door. Because we got the birds right here on our side. All right? person come to church, hear the word of God, and the whole while be occupied by a gadget, by a cell phone. I'm convinced that Satan comes every Sunday and he wants to make sure, he wants to remind you, in fact, before you leave the house, he wants to make sure that you don't forget your cell phone. 
please make sure you got, you might forget your Bible, but take your cell phone. And some of you, he'll even convince you, you've probably rationalized in your mind, well, I got my Bible here, so I got to have this here. Never mind, I never use it. Uh, but it's on there. I got my Bible with me. And, uh, you know, Pastor Fry will, will probably ask about it. But I'll, I'll, look at, I'll, I'll look at the scripture. Okay, I'll look at the scripture with, with him as he reads the scripture. But as soon as that's, oh, oh, oh I just got a notification. Oh, did you see this? Let me check it out. Oh, oh somebody liked my post. Oh, cool. And man, my, my mind is is off and never comes back. The birds have successfully snatched the seed of God's word. We carry on our side, in our purse, in our pocket, we carry one of the most effective tools of Satan in this world. Now, I'm not saying cell phones are evil. You know that. I, I obviously have one right here, all right? And occasionally I get notifications during service. Most, by the way, if you do, I, it's, I, heart, I always keep this on vibrate, and it doesn't vibrate very strongly. So uh, when, when I miss calls, I miss... And so at, at certain times, I have to pull out intentionally and see, okay, what notifications have I missed? What phone calls have I missed? Um, and I can assure you that I, if it buzzes during the, my sermon, I, it's, I, I won't feel it. But you know how those things are. Social media is addictive. Oh, did somebody re- reply to me? Did somebody comment? Did somebody share what I had to share? Those things are addictive. And they are ways of drawing a person away from the Word of God. Oh, I have in my notes some of the tactics. I, I wish I had time to go through this. You know, back in the... Uh, in the old camp meeting days, you know, camp meeting still happens, but uh, tactics have changed somewhat. But some of you remember the the old camp meeting days, no air conditioning, you, know, you had to open up the windows and you know, that kind of thing. But some of the tactics that, that preachers would use just to draw a crowd, all right? And it was effective. And there's one, I, I can't remember, some of you, would, you can tell me after church, but there was one preacher Maybe his Uncle Bud Robinson, maybe not. But there's one preacher who actually uh, tied a rope up to the beam and grabbed a hold of it and swung out over the audience as he was preaching. Did anyone ever hear about that? Uh, there have been, I've heard stories of, of evangelists walking over the top of the pews and, and just doing all kinds of things. Just doing what? I remember I read a story one time of this guy who, who did get saved later, but he said he would come to camp meeting. He was a sinner, didn't really care. He'd become drunk sometimes, but he wanted to make sure he was in camp meeting because he didn't know what was going to happen. He just wanted to be there to witness it. He just, it, was, it was entertaining to him. It was funny. It was exciting. It was, and that, that was one way that preachers used, and by the way, a lot of them effectively used to draw people in and to try to bring them down to the Word of God. Now, some of them never got to the Word of God, but nonetheless, they certainly had people's attention. But when they did get to the word of God, it was there and they, they were able to win people to, to Christ. So it was effective, some of it not. But there are things that, that pastors, preachers, teachers, that we do, we have to recognize that when, I have to recognize when I preach, I am battling with, the, with Satan. I am battling because I, as God's servant trying to deliver God's word, I'm battling all of the other spiritual influences that are working within our congregation. And I have to do my best to try to counter that and keep your attention. I do have a responsibility. I can't just dryly go through, you know, verse, here's what this word means. And here's what this word means. And here's the Greek and Hebrew. I, I, if, if that's effective, I'll do that. If that's appropriate, if that's what God wants me to do, I'll do that. But if I just do that dryly, what am I doing? I'm not really carefully considering that there are other forces at work and that I have, to, I have to battle against that as a preacher. And I better do something to keep your attention if I can to try to counter that because there are birds circling around and Satan's birds have eagle eyes and they know exactly where the seeds are falling and they're going to be there to snatch everything that falls in that, on that roadside. They're going to be there. They're not going to wait. And if they can do it even before you hit the door, they're going to do it. Well, let's move on to the next seed that the sower sowed. He says in verse 5, other seed fell on the rocky ground. This rocky ground is a place where it did not have much soil, he tells us. There's, there, it's, it's mostly rocks, a little bit of soil, but not much, very little. And he says immediately this seed 
he says immediately it did spring up, but since it had no depth in the soil, when the sun rose and it was, it was scorched because it had no root, and it withered away. Now let's go over to Jesus' explanation in verse 16. He says, and these are the ones that are sown on the rocky ground. Here it is. The ones who, when they hear the word of God, immediately they receive it with joy. Well, that's great. Immediately receiving it with joy. In fact, that's, uh, that's desirable. I, want every, I, I love it when people say, oh, pastor, that, that was just a powerful word from God. Oh, that makes me feel good. But then if you walk on out and your mind goes on and there's no effect, no change, no, no produce, no fruitfulness from the word of God, well, thank you for telling me I preached a good sermon, but that's not the point. The point is fruitfulness in your life and my life. By the way, it has to bear fruit in my life first. It better. And so Jesus says, this is like those who hear the word. Notice again, the ones on the pathway where the birds came, they heard the word. Now we're in the rocks. And some of it falls among the rocks. And they hear as well. They hear the word too. But there's no, there's no real root there. And it says, verse 17, they have no root in themselves, but they endure for a while. The word of God, they receive it with joy and they endure for a while. So what happened? Well, it says that they endure for a while, but then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, that's important, on account of the word, as I was telling them last night, this doesn't mean when tribulation or trials come because I didn't take care of the tires on my vehicle and so they wore out and, they, and I had to replace it because it went flat or I had a blowout, all right? That's my fault. That's not God's word's fault. That's not God's fault. That's just ignorance on my behalf, perhaps, uh, perhaps neglect. That's my fault. No, no, he says, when persecution, when trials come on account of the word, what's that mean? It means that when I... When the word of God is planted in my life, I hear that and I try to live that. I, it endures for a little while. I receive it with joy and it endures for a little while. But then as I try to live God's way according to his word, I start suffering for it. God says that's like rocky ground. That's like seed sown in rocky ground. I give up. As soon as conflict comes, because I'm trying to do what God tells me to do, what God's word tells me to do, as soon as that creates conflict in my life and discomfort, whoa, I'm out of here, God. You didn't tell me it was going to be that bad. Whoa, God, can you just reduce the size of the cross that I have to carry to follow you? I, I, I'm willing to take up a cross, but not that big, really? Uh, just give me a little cross, Jesus. I'll follow you if you just give me one that I can, I can walk uprightly and strongly and confidently. Yeah, I'll do it. And Jesus says, no, no, I want to give you, I, I, give me that little cross. Let me give you one that's a little larger. And you say, ah, it's too much conflict. It creates too much discomfort in my life. And Jesus says, when that happens, that's evidence of what your heart condition is. Your heart condition is one that gives out. It may respond with joy immediately. It may endure for a while. But when conflict comes, you're done. Unfruitful. Now let's go to the third, the third area where the, the seed is sown. This is among the thorns in verse 7. He says, other seed fell among the thorns. Thorns grew up and choked it and it yielded no grain. And so we have moved from the roadside to the area where the rocks are. Now to a patch that has not been weeded. It's not been plowed, but it's, it's, it, it is, it's full of weeds. But some seed falls in there. Now, this is, this is a fascinating place to consider. This is fascinating. Look at what Jesus says about it. He says it in verse 18. Do you see this? Verse 18. Others are, are the ones sown among the thorns. What happens? These, these are the ones who hear the word. Again, the third time. They hear the word. But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter and choke the word and it proves unfruitful. Hmm, that's interesting. Choked by thorns. Choked out by weeds. 
Jesus gives us a clear explanation of what the seeds represent. They represent, well, let's just, let's just, let's just call it worldliness. Worldly desire, desire for, for comfort, desire for wealth, desire for riches, desire for just the things of the world. All right? And worldliness, by the way, is any, any desire for temporal things over eternal things. All right? So, for instance, we're, you know, I, I told you at the outset of this service, we are, we're trying to raise $100,000 for something. Yes, these facilities, one of these days, these facilities, they're, they're temporal. But what we're raising money for is not for building. It is for the building. But the reason we want the building is to reach people and to change people's lives. You're not giving to a building. You're giving to a vision of people's lives being changed. That's eternal. But I know how the devil works. He says, well, you really have these needs. You, know, you, have, you have this to do on your house. You have this. You, know, you, need, you need to update your car sometime soon. What about that vacation? What about these other things? Uh, once you get money all of that, then really, I really, Pastor Fry, don't really have anything left to give for that. Hey, I've, I've thought those same thoughts too. So I, I'm sure you have. And you, you get that pledge card and you think, man, and every time you, you think, well, maybe, maybe I'll give, maybe I'll give a thousand dollars. Oh, but man, I'll, I just, oh, what about that? Oh, I, I had this extra expense I wasn't counting on. And you, you, you start rationalizing, right? Let me tell you something. No human rationale would put anything in this for the church. All right, no human rationale. You, ha- you, have to, you have to see things from God's perspective to be able to say, you know what, man, every, the more I can give, the more it goes to eternity, the more treasure I'm storing up in heaven. What am I talking about? I'm talking about God sowing the word and then other things choking it out. There are a lot of things that can choke us out. Now, notice the, the rocky soil. The reason people give up there is because of conflict, right? Persecution comes on account of the word. It gets difficult. It's just too hard. Conflict, so I give up. These people, though, this kind of soil, it's not conflict. It's comfort that's the problem. The total opposite. This one over here, it doesn't make me comfortable. I'm going to give up. It, it, it makes my life difficult. I'm giving up. Over here, it's... No, I, I, would, I want these comforts that the world says that I can gain. And so it's more on account of that. Not conflict, but I want the comforts. And God's word says I might have to give this up or that up or that up. I might have to stop going there. I might have to stop hanging around this person who seems so much fun. It's so fun to be, to be there, to do that. And God says, no, that has no part in this walk of righteousness. You got to cut that out. And a person, because of a desire for the comforts of this world, gives up on the word of God. It chokes it out. What are some things that can choke out the word of God? Let me start with some simple things, all right? And this is absolutely true. You've experienced this, and I have. Uh, The media that you listen to. Music. Remember, ears? Listen. He who has ears, let him hear. The things you look at, the movies, whatever it is you put in front of your face. And that, that's, those two things are chief. What you allow to come into your ears, what you allow to pass through your eyes, those things are very liable to choke out the Word of God. Very liable to take something that you have learned from Scripture Something that, that, that tells you that you're, you're, supposed to be, you're supposed to be thinking on good things. You're supposed, to be, uh, you're supposed to be living a certain kind of life that Christ teaches us to live. And there are all kinds of scriptures that we could talk about this morning. And, and you think, well, yeah, I want that kind of life. I want the life that, that meditates on, on what's good and what's wholesome and what's holy. And I don't want to bring something into my life that's going to, to take that away. But then we, we're, we're, we leave church and we're somewhere else. And then we think, well, I mean, it's just, you know, it's just this, it's just that. You know, it's not, not a big deal. Where's the, where's the consistency? And what we know the Word of God tells us, okay, because we've heard that. We've received it with joy even, and we've allowed it to endure for a little while, but then when it makes us uncomfortable or it conflicts with something else we like, what's going to give? So what's the heart condition? What's the soil? It may be feelings or desires that you foster. Jealousy, anger, lust, 
materialism, all of those kinds of things. You can hear the word of God. You can hear a sermon on, on purity. You can hear a, a sermon on, on having good speech. That there's, The scripture has something to say about the fruit of our lips as well. I'm going to preach on that uh, several weeks from now. We can talk about you know, being in unity with our brother and sister and getting along and, and, and uh, having a good atmosphere for Christian fellowship. We can talk about all of that, but then when we walk away and we, and we experience conflict or we're not experiencing the kind of comfort that we want, we forget all of that. That tells us that our, what kind of soil our heart condition is. It's the kind of soil that Jesus describes here that is being choked out by thorns. Oh, there, is, there are a lot of other things. You know, busyness, little, little things that just squeeze out time for God. Now, let me say this, and I say this carefully. I say this purposefully, though, and I want you to hear this. I didn't put this on the screen. I should have because it helps for you to hear it and to see it and to write it. All right? But I want you to listen to this. I mean this. That if you are not practicing, if you do not have a daily habit that takes you to a place of communion with Christ in prayer and meditation of his word, you are not yet at least out of spiritual infancy. You may be spiritually dead, but you are certainly not out of spiritual infancy. And some of you need to look at your life and say, well, I have it for the last 30 years. But I feel like that I'm more than an infant. You cannot be more than an infant if you're not feeding yourself spiritually daily. Jesus says we do not live by bread alone, but by the word of the Lord. How can a person survive spiritually or grow spiritually without a daily diet of God's word? Oh, but then we come to the last portion here. And this is the good seed. The good news is this. Jesus points out that there was a seed. Now, he used the plural, or the singular. There's a seed that fell in this roadside. The bird snatched it away. There's a seed that fell in this rocky soil. It didn't take root very deeply, and it was scorched. It dried up. It died. There was a seed that, that was that made its way over to this other ground where the thorns and the weeds were, and it got choked out. But he says, now he moves to the plural, but there were seeds that made it to the field where the sower intended. And those seeds, they weren't conflicted by the thorns. They overcame the birds. They overcame the sun because they stuck roots down deeply and the word took hold. Notice what happens here in verse 20. He says, but those that were sown in the good soil are the ones who hear the word of God... You got this? They heard it, just like the others did. They heard it. But when they heard it, they accepted it. They accepted. And after they accepted, once they had heard it, once they had accepted it, then he says, it bore fruit. The seed bore fruit. Now notice this. So I don't know how many seeds the sower went out and sowed, but... There's one here that didn't get, do anything, one there that didn't do anything, one there that wasn't fruitful, but there's a whole bunch that was. And he says this seed that made it to the good soil, he says it, it, it bore fruit 30-fold, 60-fold, and some 100-fold. Talking about the fruit of God's Word, the fruitfulness of God's Word. Hearing the Word... Accepting it, which means paying attention to, to when any, any time the Word of God is given to us, whether it's preaching, teaching, small group, where in your personal time, when the Word of God is sown, you accept it, you take it. For us in our, in our family, that also means memorization, memorizing Scripture. You know, one of the Scriptures that I've been, memor I've been memorizing several out of, out of uh, Proverbs. Some of you at school, you've been, you've been hearing me. I, I, my kids come in. And they know that dad has a stash of chocolate somewhere. And uh, some of them have discovered it. Some of them haven't. But they know I have it somewhere. And they come in. And, and the little ones especially like, Daddy, can I have, some, can I have a Reese cup? A little Reese cup. And, and so I tell them, well, I'd be happy to give you one. But you got to say your scripture. What's your scripture? And it's amazing. I mean, little kids, all right? My, my kids, when they're this old, they're five. But they're, little kids can, can memorize scripture just like that. 
I mean, some, like Corin knows scripture. He, he probably knows it better than any of us. I'll say, okay, Proverbs 18, 13, Proverbs 19, 11. So those are some that we've recited at school recently. And, and, and they get it. They know it. So one, that I memorized, the thing I mentioned last night. Do you remember what it was I mentioned last night? You read it three times. Proverbs 10, 10, 19, right? Verse 19. And the first part of that scripture says, where words are many, transgression is not lacking. All right. I'll have Weston stand up like I did last night and read it three times because that takes a minute. Like, wait, the scripture says that? Where words are many, transgression is not lacking? Wait, James, doesn't James 1, 17 tell us, let every man be slow to speak, right? But quick to hear, but slow to speak, slow to anger, right? So, I mean, why do these stand out to me? Because I struggle being slow to, slow to speak, all right? So you, you know that. I don't have to tell you that. And so I have, to, I have to tell myself that. Now, so that's the seed. God's word has been planted in my heart. So if I talk too much in a conversation that we're having, just say, all you got to do is say Proverbs 10, 19. <laughs> all right. Proverbs 10, 19. And you will find out how rooted that word is. If I say, oh, what in the world's Proverbs? What's Proverbs 10, 19? I don't remember what that is. Why have I died? Well, that's evident because I've been dwelling on this scripture. If I say that to you, you know that I have starved the word, the seed, and I've forgotten what Proverbs 10, 19 is, okay? Now, I won't hold you accountable to that, but you can hold me accountable to that, all right? But there may be a scripture, and there always should be. There should always be something, some scripture that you have that you're trying to put in practice. There should be. Every disciple of Christ, if we are growing, every disciple of Christ ought to have something from God's word that you can tell me after church if I, if I ask, and I'm not going to, but you can say, you know what? This is the scripture that God has been speaking to me. And if you don't have that, I challenge you, go to the book of Proverbs. Start there, all right? You'll probably never get out of there. You'll be there the rest of your life. That's a great place to be. That's okay. God will speak to you through that. But you accept the word, and then it bears fruit. So at some point, if I don't ever control my mouth, and I just let multiple, many sins come out, all right, where words are many, transgression is not lacking. If I, if I never learn to apply that appropriately to my life, it's like the person who hears the word, enjoys it for a while, and endure, endures for a while, but then it doesn't, it dies. But Jesus says in the good soil, it bears fruit. It's the fruit of obedience. It's the obedience to the word and to the spirit and fruit that is born 30 times, 60 times, 100 times. What's God saying? God is saying that you can't do this within yourself, but when you obey my word, it will grow and flourish in your life spiritually in such a way, my spirit will bless it so much that your life will blossom in the likeness of Christ. That's the fruitfulness of his word. Your life will blossom and you will, look, you will look like Christ looks. Because that is what happens when you obey his word. The fruitfulness of God's word. Would you stand with me this morning? Gracious Father, our request to you today is that the words that you have given to us from Mark 4, from other places where we have been reading this week, Father, would you root that deeply within our heart, O oh God. For some of us, that means that we need to go spend some time this afternoon and go back to those scriptures that we read this week that we've already forgotten and dwell on it to allow it to take deeper root. Father, would you bring an awareness to us to those things that we have allowed into our lives that choke out the Word of God? That would you bring us an awareness of the, the birds that are circling overhead that are just waiting to snatch away the Word of God from us one seed at a time? until we are starved spiritually. Lord, I believe the desire of this congregation and those who are listening, I believe that our desire is to know your word and to live it and to practice it and to grow in it and for it to bear fruit in our lives. Lord, would you show us the fruitfulness of your word as we heed, as we listen, as we accept it, and as we allow you to bear that fruit in our lives from your word. Let us walk in obedience to what you say to us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.